What's up, pre-calculus students? Mr. Meister coming at you. We're, we're recording this video during fourth period. Uh, obviously, they're my favorite period in the world. But most days, they're actually tied with the other two periods. So this is for all of you. We're also watching the Masters as we're doing this homework video. Are you kidding me, Bryson? Uh, Bryson DeShabo just birdied five of the last six holes, and he's minus seven. This is not fair. Uh, let's do the homework video. So this is free response question two on the AP pre-calculus test. It will always look like this. It always starts with getting a couple pieces of data from the initial part, uh, finding an equation to model it, then using the couple pieces of data to talk about rates of change, then talking about how your rates of change uh, and your model compare to each other. So we're talking about a Chinese bamboo tree. We have after one week, the tree measures three feet. We like to put that down as like a point one three where we have like an x and a y and then we have 589 time in weeks feet we want to write two equations hey period four whisper Shh. Bros, you can talk just a little bit quieter. All right, one A is always write two equations or three equations so that we could potentially algebraically solve for A and B. So we have this, we see T, we see H of T, uh, easy with the dice, gentlemen. And here are two equations, when T is one, h of t or y is three you have three equals who is doing the dice move the dice game to that side go 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 stand up and go and then the other one would be 89 equals a b to the fifth now let me show you two different ways to find a and b we'll show you the easy way the easy way is to plug in your information and to use your calculator to produce the exact equation of the exponential model. Maybe we'll use it later, maybe not, who knows. And like, that's it. We get A is 1.285 dot, dot, dot. B is 2.333 dot, dot, dot. But, let me show you how to find those values without using your calculator. Sometimes if you're using your calculator, you might get an answer or your calculator might not work. All of a sudden there's an error that pops up. Always have math to back you up. Or maybe math should be the first option and the calculator is the backup. So we can set up and solve a system. Here we have 89 equals AB to the fifth. We have three equals a, b to the first. We can either solve one of the equations for a variable and substitute into the other one. Or since they are two equations, we could set something up um, where we could divide the two equations. And we can use our calculator to do the division step. And again, I'm going to show you how to get a and b a different way. We get this 29.66 value. The A's will cancel and I get B to the fourth. I'll take both sides to the one fourth power and watch I get the value of B, 2.333, just like I did before.
Once you find B, you can substitute it into either equation to find A. So I will divide 3 by that, and I will get that value of A, 1.285. So calculator can be used. Don't forget about math. Part B, use the given data. Card game, shush. That's you, Pombo. Yeah, I dropped your name. Shh. Use the given data to find the average rate of change of the height in feet per week. Okay, this is always going to be part B, finding an average rate of change. It's going to be very easy to do. We have our feet per week, y2 minus y1, x2 minus x1. This is the increase in the amount of feet over the course of four weeks. This is 21.5 feet per week. Interpret the meaning. It's an average rate of change. You could say on average, the height is either increasing or decreasing based on a positive or negative slope. On average, the height is increasing 21.5 feet per week over the weeks one to five. Consider the average rates of change from five to P, where P is greater than five. Are these average rates of change less than or greater than the average rate of change from one to five? This always shows up in this question too, where you need to think about what is your model. Your model is an exponential function. We could have looked at it if we wanted to, but you know what an exponential function looks like. Your model for H has to be some increasing at an increasing rate graph. We can see if we went from say one to five that the average rates of change, which would be the slope of this line, is going to be shallower, less than the average rate of change from five to some future thing. Because we're increasing at an increasing rate, because we're exponential, this slope is going to be bigger than that slope. So we're going to answer greater than with the reasoning being um, exponential functions, rates, increase. So our average rates of change are going to increase. For which t value four weeks to 11 weeks should biologists have more confidence in when using the model H? Obviously, we should be picking four. It's inside two points that we know. Um, it is not good to predict out into the future. Uh, bamboo trees won't continue to grow exponentially. So it's some kind of explanation of that. Uh, T equals four. For whatever reasons, you could talk about um, inside two known data points versus outside. You could talk about trees, bamboo trees in the real world won't grow exponentially or else we'd be looking at bamboo trees all going to space here. So T equals four, whatever reasoning you have behind that. Cool, one down, next one. Uh, this question, I would not uh, try to find the answers by hand. It's possible, but it's just gonna be a lot of work. You have three points, T, which is responding for X's, and number of cars, which are Y's. Shh, thank you. So I'm going to write the three equations just by plugging in uh, my T's and my L's. I got 4 equals C. Okay, that's one thing. I got 21 equals A times 5 squared plus B times 5 plus C, which I already found, but cool. 
and then I got 14 equals a times 8 squared plus b times 8 plus 4. And again, I could solve these two equations, the system of equations. I could solve for a variable, substituting the other. You could use elimination, all options, but probably even myself, I would uh, stat edit this. Quadrag. And there's A, B, and C. Three decimal places, places round or truncate. All right, same thing. Find the average rate of change from five to eight hours. Show the computations. Talk about it. Uh, so we got 14 minus 21. We decreased six. Oh, and Tiger Woods birdied the first hole. Unbelievable. Over the course of three hours. which means we're decreasing on average two cars per hour in the parking lot. Cool. Use the average rate of change to estimate the number of cars in the parking lot, T equals seven. This is a very good uh, thing to be able to do. Um, there are other questions with this free response too that require you to use your average rate of change. Um, it is up to you which way you want to go. You have two points that you know. I'm going to show you how to get this value Shh. two different ways. We know that at eight, we have 14 cars in the lot. Well, if we decrease by two cars in the lot over these three hours, we must be coming from 16. It's got to show the computation. So probably what I'm doing is saying, I took 14 cars in the lot and I'm uh, adding two cars per hour. Uh, or you're, you can... Think of it as being a line. You could use like the point slope form. I don't think it's necessary. You could just say, um, I had 14 cars in the lot, and then I'm going to subtract negative two cars over one hour, you add two cars, you get 16. Let's see the other way to do that. Oh, I messed up. That's what I thought. Never mind. So I need to add seven thirds. So sixteen and a third cars. One way, or we could have gone from the 21 cars in the lot, and we could have added the negative seven thirds cars per hour over the course of two hours. This is also going to get you 16.333 cars. So it's just doing like the cars per hour over the amount of hours. If you remember back in the day, this is like the first question that I would give you that people would get wrong is applying the rate of change. But you get the same value. The average rates of change found in part one can be used to estimate the number of cars in the parking lot at time t for greater than eight hours. Well, these estimates 
be less than or greater than the number of cars predicted in the model. Okay, so it's if we continue to use this minus seven thirds carbs per hour, what will the estimates produce? Well, for this situation, we have to think about what our model looks like again. Our model is this negative quadratic. And we are talking about uh, rates decreasing. So my slopes are going to get more and more negative or less and less positive. If I use the slope between 5 and eight i don't really care exactly where it falls relative to the max but let's say it's here and here these slopes past that or if i use these slopes past that my line would be above my quadratic because rates are decreasing um so the predictions from the line would be over the actual predictions The answer is greater than quadratic functions. Quadratic is going to decrease at a decreasing rate. So using a linear model off your average rates of change would produce overestimates. If you use a slope of a secant, an average rate of change, your values on that line past that will be above the curve. That says overestimates. Say greater than Quadratic decreases at a decreasing rate. Um, it's not just any quadratic. Our quadratic model will decrease at a decreasing rate. Linear model will produce over approximations. Good to see Victor Hovland do so well. It's good to see Wyndham Clark doing well. Let's do number three. We got a rumor. We got amount of people who've heard the rumor at a certain time. All right, cool. This one's interesting. I feel like we're going to have to use algebra to find A and B because we have 215. I'm going to use 215 for the top equation. I get 15 is the total amount of people that hear the rumor after two hours. So I can find A very easily. So really, there's no modeling done. It's just there's no systems having to be solved. 15 divided by 7 is A. And then the other piece of information is 67 people have heard the rumor. We got this value. at t equals 6. Well, let's just solve the equation. 67 plus 213.29 divided by the natural log of 6. We may or may not use that model. Probably don't need to. This looks like it's an exponential growth. And then looks looks like a logarithmic function. So it's going to be increasing at an increasing rate. And then it's going to stop at six hours and it's going to start increasing at a decreasing rate.
All right, same thing, average rate of change. Show the computations, 67 minus 15 over, 6 minus 2. Shh. Thank you. Thirteen. What are the wise students? Shh. After the X's hours. Shush. Interpret the meaning of the answer. So um, on average, it's always good to start with on average. Uh, the on average 13 more students uh, heard the rumor per hour. Or you could say the total students who have heard the rumor was increasing by 13 students per hour. All right, consider the values that result from using the average rate of change found in one to estimate the number of students that heard the rumor for P from zero to six. Are these estimates less than or greater than the number of students predicted by the model? Okay. We are talking about this portion. This portion is an exponential function. It's an exponential function that is increasing concave up. You could use your graphing calculator to see that, but instead let's consider what we're doing from two to six. Okay, let's just picture an exponential function that's increasing concave up. If I did two to six, I could see this would be the slope. That is that 13 that I found. If I used this average rate of change to go back in time, I could see that this line would be underneath my increasing concave up function, which means I would be producing underestimates. So the answer is less than why you could just say an exponential function or you could say r of t is exponential from zero to six therefore the rates increase and using a linear and using the average rate of change from two to six would produce underestimates. For T that's less than two. Hold on a second. P is between zero and six. Well, I'm sorry, I kind of read this wrong. Like between two and six, I have overestimates. But to the left of two, I have underestimates. So I, I, I am talking about all the inter, uh, values between zero and six. So rates are increasing. Using the average rate of change, we would be underestimates. 
from zero to two and overestimates from two to six. I probably should be a little bit better. T belongs to zero and two, or you could be like T between zero and two, and then overestimates for T being between two and six. R is exponential from zero to six. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that's right. Uh, question number four. We wanted to trick you with this question to make you use uh, stuff by hand, but then the rest of the question doesn't work out. So I'd like you to change this. We did this in class for my students. So we got most of it done, but I wanted it to not work and see that this log is off. Actually, even if we do it like this, you're gonna see something that's wrong. Uh, change that to two and nine. It'll help for the rest of the problem. Okay, write two equations for A and B. So I got two to 20, we got nine to 70. And here are the two equations. 220 equals A plus B log three. 270 equals A plus B log 10. Cool. Now watch what happens if I stat edit this. And I calculate a logarithmic regression. This isn't going to be right. This is wrong. And all you just copying this down, I kind of want you to copy it down because you've paused the video and you're like, oh, I like to just fast forward, fast forward, fast forward, pause. Well, I'm going to tell you you're wrong for doing that. There's a reason why. This is a plus b log x, but this is a plus b log x plus 1. If you wanted to use the regression capabilities of your calculator, you got to understand that you're plugging in 3 and 10, not 2 and 9. So we kind of wanted you to get that error by plugging in 0, but this is fine. Now, if we calculate the, uh, the logarithmic regression, we get the correct values of A and B. Let me show you how to get those by hand. Um, you can't divide these equations because it's, uh, it's a sum. Rather, you can solve for a variable and substitute in. You could use log properties, actually, but regardless, watch what I'm going to do. I'm going to just subtract this. I'm going to do 220, and this is... Uh, A2 by hand. 220 minus B log 3 equals A. Substitute that in for A. Shush! Shh! Thank you. So that's 50 equals negative B log 3. Well, 
plus B log 10. Probably you're thinking of factoring out a B and that's what I would, I would do. And then I can use my calculator to get that. Let's find B to be 41.529, 50, let's just do negative log three plus log 10. You can use X uh, logarithmic rules to, to write that as something else. 50 divided by that is going to be that number. Oops. 41.529. There you go. This is a little bit more intense, but like you're smart AP pre-calculus students, you can do this. Once you get B, you can find A easily. Watch. Plug B back into either equation. 270 minus B log 10. 174.375. There you go. Don't forget about math. Just because you have a calculator doesn't mean you can't do math. B. Average rate of change, it's like these problems are like a broken record. 270 minus 200 over 9 minus 2. Seventy over five. Seven. I can't do math with that. Ten. Pounds per week. On average, the athlete or Mr. Passwater, max bench press increased by 10 pounds per week over the course of the weeks between two and nine. All right, three. This one we got into class and it's like, oh, this is this seems off. But now that I change these back to two and nine, I think it's gonna work. Let A of T be the estimate of the max bench press using the average rate of change. So we're gonna use the average rate of change, which was 10. What am I doing? This is 220, I screwed up. It's 50 over seven. Felt that that was wrong. Seven point one four two. Okay. Scheffler's on twelve. He pushed it left. Oh, he's in the back bunker. He didn't push it left, but he's in the back bunker. Okay. It is known that A of 12 is 277.65. Let's make sure that works out. If I start at 270 for the ninth week, I 
<laughs> I'm really sorry. I really screwed up on this one. This was supposed to be two. This was supposed to stay as eight. Oh, shoot. All right, let's just really quickly change everything. <laughs> uh, you understand how to do it by hand. If I were to use my calculator, it was supposed to be three and nine. I was like thinking ahead. Here's my logarithmic regression. I'm storing at that. That's my A and my B. That was supposed to be nine. This was supposed to be log nine. This is supposed to be log nine. This is supposed to be log nine. This is supposed to be log nine. You will get the correct A and B from before by doing the exact same thing. That's log nine. This is supposed to be 50 over six. This should work out so that the problem isn't wrong. 8.333 8 8.333 I don't even know if that works out because if I have 8 I'll have 4 more weeks what is what is that Of four more weeks of eight pounds per week. No, no, that was supposed to be nine. I think this problem is just wrong. We discovered this in class too. If this is nine, and this is nine, and the average rate of change is that, if I start at 270 pounds and I'm approximating, using the average rate of change, I'm going off of the 270 and I'm increasing seven pounds per week. So 277.65 doesn't make sense to me. So this data must be different from what was originally written in the problem. So get rid of this. I'm sorry. And then I actually did screw it up. I wanted this to be nine, not eight. So let's go back. We were right. One seventy four point three seven. Everything was right. All right, this is what it's known. It's known that 
A of 12 is 270 plus this many pounds per week for three weeks. 291.428. All right, cool. Compute the residual of this estimate compared to the value given by the model B of 12. Well, unfortunately, I did not store my model. So let's go back and store your model. Cool. Now that I've stored it, I can Y1 of 12. I mean, it's really close to what it's supposed to be, but. Compute the residual of this estimate compared to the value given by the model. All right, so we're gonna say that the value of the model is the actual. So actual minus estimate predicted is 277.571 minus 291.428. So this minus that is a residual of negative 13.856. For t is greater than nine, the residuals will always be negative y. This goes back to understanding what does your model look like? What do your average rates of change look like? Your average rates of change will come off of a linear equation that if get extended, would be producing overestimates. If we are talking about residuals being the values on my actual curve versus the values that I'm estimating using the line, actual minus predicted will always be negative. So they really just want you to talk about how uh, linear estimates would be over the logarithmic function because a logarithmic function's increasing at a decreasing rate. Uh, estimates from using the average rate of change would be over since our logarithmic <laughs> equation increases at a decreasing rate. Okay, you gotta have those words in there. Okay, Mr. Passwater decides that he should use model B, the logarithmic, to make predictions about his maximum bench press beyond 12 weeks, as long as the difference in the predicted maximum bench press between B and A does not exceed 20 pounds. How many weeks should Passwater use Model B? Uh, honestly, it might be best to just solve an equation. When does A of T minus B of T equal 20? We should have some sort of an expression for A of T. Uh, this is where we kind of just use an equation. We are starting with 270 pounds plus my 7.142 pounds per week after the ninth week. So if I plug in nine, I get 270. Boom. If I plug in 10, I have 7.142 times one. Uh, this is probably what I'm doing. So we have our model here. We're going to have 270 plus 7.142. Let's store that value.
270 plus this many per week after week nine. Let's graph y2 minus y1, or we can see where they intersect. Uh, well, when it's when it does it equal twenty? That's the that's the important. Thing. We don't see when they intersect. We see when they equal twenty. And again, we can subtract the twenty and then see when they intersect. Or let's just say, when does this equal twenty? I'm sure most students would actually use the table, but I'm sure some of you would think to do this. I'm going to adjust my window to after week nine. I'm going to zoom fit so I can see things. And I'm going to see when it equals 20. So 20 should be in there. And we should be sometimes before 20 and sometimes after. My residuals will keep increasing or keep decreasing. They'll be negative and more negative. This will be bigger than this. It's the same as if the residual equaled negative 20. I'm saying is the difference is 20. So, yeah, it works out. after the 13th week. That's a good, tricky question. I don't know if I'll show you something like that, but guys, be open to uh, setting something up and solving. All right? But hopefully we understand most of the problems are all about modeling, then finding an average rate of change, and then comparing our straight lines from our average rate of change to our models that have curvature. Over or underestimates based on that kind of leads you into calculus in your future when we talk about tangent lines to curves, but it's not as um, thorough, rigorous in this class. It'll be more rigorous in the future. All right, that's it. Mr. Mester is out.